improving confidence. In some ways, I feel like in, in the markets, we're, we're starting to get a bit of that um, even flowing through to us. But then again, these volumes are so light, it's hard to know even if the market's really convinced about even those signs of life that we're talking about. We are seeing extremely light volumes, but you know, numerous studies have been done around investor behaviour and once they've been burnt, they are reluctant to come back to the party. So it is taking a little bit of time for volumes to come back and confidence to come back to the market. In terms of those US confidence numbers, we're seeing those numbers now at four-year highs and it's understandable. We've seen the housing market really stabilising there and we've also seen the US stock market doing quite well. So that wealth effect, which makes consumers quite confident when they do see the value of their homes stabilizing and indeed rising now as well as the US stock market doing quite well is a positive for consumer confidence and we've seen that reflected in the numbers. We also saw the US case Shiller numbers and that was the housing market. We saw a jump of 3% and then durable goods orders. Now this is an important indicator into the confidence that businesses have in um, investing in the future and while the numbers were flat if you ex exclude out the transportation we actually saw a rise of one and a half percent and those numbers coming in ahead of expectations. So all up, the US numbers were good, even though the US stock performance wasn't last night. Um, Julie, your thoughts on, I suppose, the, um, the hangover effect that we've seen from the global financial crisis, Just talking about, you know, some underlying confidence that's there, but it has been taking some time. There are the guys, particularly the fixed income guys, who suggest that there's been a structural shift, that this increased uh, weighting, if you like, to more defensive, more fixed income, um, parts of a portfolio is going to remain. Do you subscribe to that or do you think that investors are likely to get the greed bug back again when they start seeing sustained rise across globes, across equities? James, I think part of this is about that hangover from the global financial crisis, but I do agree that there is a structural shift in some of those developed nations, like we have seen in Japan over the last couple of years, where we have seen the baby boomer generation and retirees becoming a larger proportion of the population. And we know that risk profiles as people get older and towards retirement do become more conservative towards some of those more fixed income products rather than equity type products. Even here in Australia over the next two decades, what we are going to see is that baby boomer and retiree generation increasing as a percentage of the population. So that structural shift certainly going on in major parts of the world. And so I don't think fixed income investments are, are, are just here to stay because of the market conditions, but perhaps we are seeing a bit of a structural shift which may continue over the next couple of decades. Having said that, most people do agree that US government bonds are overvalued at the moment, but you know, there were calls for that three, uh, four years ago and still they've managed to continue to uh, to have some great performance over the past uh, few years. The worst movers today just in, t in the open we've got uh, JB Hi-Fi in um, third spot on the bottom performers on the ASX 200. Julia on the flip side Aristocrat that's actually your second best performer as we're speaking now on the S&P ASX 200 it's up by 3.1 percent. Um, there was some a guidance upgrade tell us how that kind of matched up to expectations th those results. We've seen Aristocrat Leisure coming out with its full year result and just having a look at the result and it has beat expectations. If we have a look at this result, the company was guiding between 85 to 90 million dollars and that was the guidance issued back in August. They've actually come in just under that 92 million dollar mark, beating expectations. We have a look at Aristocrat Leisure, they manufacture poker machines as well as look at gaming software uh, development and all up it does look like the company's been doing quite well. It's been a difficult couple of years and now the evidence is is mounting that we have seen the low in terms of the earnings cycle already having passed. So I guess the question is, is uh, how, how high it can go now. It does have a leverage to that cyclical recovery story. Uh, the shares doing quite well on the back of this result and the outlook. Really the momentum here in Australia, which is a key market, has continued in terms of their North American business. All business segments have seen an improvement there. They've released two new software products out into Japan. So all up, it does look like the market pretty happy with Aristocrat Leisure's uh, performance in the full year. Of course, if we do have a look at Aristocrat Leisure, this is a, just a 30-day chart of it. You can see the shares performing very positive today with a jump of 3.5% on the open. They have moved back, uh, they have moved their fi financial year. Previously it was December, they've now moved it to September. So we are looking at performer results, but it has come in ahead of expectations today. Expected to be quite a fiery one. Tell us the, the major issues that shareholders um, are going to be tackling there today. 
And the reason it's going to be such a fiery one is because we have seen the shares dropping 30% over the past month. We have a look at the share price chart of cab charge. This is what it looks like over the last 30 days. So not a pretty picture for shareholders. No doubt there's going to be a lot of question marks around its strategies. And I think shareholders have two concerns. One of the concerns is around its bus contracts and its bus business. This is a joint venture with Comfort Delgro, and we know that our uh, this joint venture missed out on two potential renewals of contracts in the metro areas in New South Wales and that's through the New South Wales government. So this bus area had been seen as diversifying earnings and stability, a stable source of earnings but now uh, question marks around the stability of earnings coming through from this area and also uh, cab charges ability to be able to uh, to go into these tenders with chance of success so um, I guess looking towards the future if we do see more tenders come through are we going to to see cab charge losing more of their bus contracts so a big question mark around the bus contracts and the other area is of course question marks around the service charge we know that the RBA has been focusing in on fees we are still waiting the results of the Victorian taxi inquiry so no doubt shareholders are going to be a little bit jittery around that service fee because this is a company and this is a business which is very sensitive to that service fee so we're really watching commentary around those two areas the service fee as well as the bus business. So Julia, on those contracts, is, it, is there some kind of suggestion that they're not going about those tenders in the right way and they need to shift their approach? Just in terms of the, the question you raised about whether they can win contracts from here, what exactly is the issue? I think the market was surprised that it wasn't able to win those two metro con contracts. Now, uh, if we have a look at cab charge, they already have these contracts up to FY13 and it was just a matter of going for that tender again and having that contract renewed. They now actually lost these two bus areas in New South Wales and I think that came as a surprise to the market. The mar market was just expecting to see cab charge get these uh, tenders across the line and really see that bus uh, that bus contract being renewed uh, past FY13. Now it looks like there's going to be an impact in terms of earnings in FY14 and FY15. Now cab charge has come out to say well that's a bit far out so we aren't expecting to really see material effects. So that gap in earnings will have to be filled somehow but I guess some concerns around cab charges ability to win those tenders seeing that it already uh, has the existing contract at the moment and uh, I guess the thought had been that it would have been the first in line to have been yeah. up for the renewal of these tenders but it's actually lost two of them so just a bit of jitters around that uh, bus business especially given that uh, I guess the market was quite positive when it went into this joint venture because it was a source of diversification of its earnings and it was seen as a stable area. But of course now that our perception of stability has disappeared.